I think we need to get beyond the thought of testosterone as all about sex drive and sexual performance and building muscle and bodybuilding, all that kind of stuff. It's about your overall health. And I'm super excited to have Tracy Gappin on the show today. Tracy, how are you? I'm great. So good to see you. Glad to be with you today. That's awesome. Um, you are doing so many amazing things in terms of the wellness and health space and helping people reach high performance. So I'm really excited to have you on here today. Let's start with maybe where you grew up and then how you got into this space. Oh yeah, thanks so much. So I grew up in the Dallas area, a suburb of Dallas, and uh, went to Texas A&M uh, University for undergrad and then medical school in Dallas. And then I did my uh, general surgery urology training in Florida, University of Florida, and I've been in Florida ever since. And, and you know, being in Miami, once you come to Florida, you, you don't ever want to leave, right? It's like paradise. And so I've been here in Sarasota since 04, and I have been a, a urologist, a, a full-time, very busy urologist for almost 25 years until about halfway through that career, Chase, I, I hit a wall really where I, I realized that I wasn't really serving the men I was seeing in the best way, meaning I'm treating kidney stones, I'm treating prostate cancer, I'm doing all this robotic surgery, all this kind of big stuff. But guys would come to me every day with literally the same complaints over and over again. I want more energy and focus. I want to lose weight, build muscle, burn fat, and I want to have better sex. And dude, traditional healthcare has no answers for any of that. It was, here's some testosterone, here's a blue pill or yellow pill, and that's it. And that's all we had. And I ran into my own health issues about halfway through my urology career that, that got me diving down one rabbit hole after another and next thing you know, I found this whole world of health optimization. And that's when I decided to really make a big pivot in my career and my life. And so many years later, I stepped away from traditional medicine, which most doctors don't ever consider. Um, and I launched the Gapit Institute for High Performance Health a few years ago so that I could help guys with those complaints, have more energy, lose weight, have better sex, and hell, live longer and better. God bless. That's amazing. And then how did you, why did you decide to... Uh, get into urology initially? Yeah, I, I always had a surgeon's mentality. I, I I knew at a very young age, actually I was in fourth grade when I knew I wanted to be a doctor. And I knew in middle school that I wanted to specifically be a surgeon. I, I like to operate with my hands. I like to fix things. Um, and so I always had the surgical mentality of, of how can I um, fix a problem, very black and white. And, and so uh, when I went to medical school, I knew I was going to be a surgeon, but didn't know what kind. And in third year medical schools where you start to learn all the different specialties and believe it or not, they all have a, a very clear personality. And the neuro neurosurgeons are a little out there. The cardiovascular surgeons are maniac obsessed with nothing but work. The orthopods are the jocks. You have um, different personalities for each specialty. And urology was something that I, I was just drawn to. It was a personality connection there um, into humor, into a little more of a, of a, of a lifestyle, um, a little more into working with men and women, young and old, and, and various aspects of uh, surgical care. And I, I don't know, I just, I, I fell upon urology and loved it for many years until I didn't. Well, let's, uh, let's get into what you found to be more rewarding. So let's go on with uh, just maybe just foundational. Why is test you feel testosterone has dropped with men and now compared to their past? Yeah, so we are experiencing what I call a testosterone epidemic where we're seeing levels worldwide plummet. There was a massive study here in the U.S. and there were two studies in Europe, one in Sweden and one in Finland, that all showed the same thing. And that is what you just uh, mentioned, and that is that levels have dropped uh, precipitously. In fact, free tea is about half of what it was 20, 30 wow. years ago. So what that means is every guy, our testosterone levels dropping as we get older. But what that those studies showed was that a 50-year-old guy today has a free testosterone level, which is the bioavailable active form of testosterone. That's about half of what it was 20 or 30 years ago in a 50 year old guy. And, and that's massive. You know, that's not just about sex. It's not just about building muscle. It's about cognitive function. It's about metabolism, energy. It's about cardiovascular health. It's about bone health. It's about longevity. And so it's a big deal that is uh, unfortunately not getting the attention it deserves. The big question is why? 
there are a lot of causes, Chase. You could look at uh, the 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 diet that we're eating, especially here in the U.S. It's very processed, refined. It's it's full of um, um, sugar. It is poor quality. You can look at stress. You can look at the massive uh, increase in stress that especially Americans are dealing with. Um, you can look at so many different aspects of our life, sedentary lifestyle, etc. But the biggest one, in my opinion, that the studies clearly point to is endocrine disruptors or toxins in our environment that's crushing testosterone. And that's, we're talking about our crops are sprayed with herbicides and pesticides. We have birth control in our water. Synthetic estradiol is in our, is our drinking water. We have plastic all over the place, plastic water bottles, plastic food containers, uh, personal care products are loaded with all kinds of chemicals. It's everywhere. And it's, it's having a, a, a dramatic effect on us on a day-to-day basis. And before going into potential uh, interventions that we can do to raise testosterone, what are some things that guys can do to counter with what you're saying? So like an example would be, you know, with uh, deodorant and shampoo to stay away from uh, the filibands and the fey weights and things like that. But what would some recommendations you have for people to try and counteract all these endocrine? Sure. So one of the first thing, yeah, so right here, like I, I'm drinking, I don't know if people are watching video or listen to this, is a, a stainless steel water container. So all my drinking water is filtered. I use a carbon block uh, filter. So all my water is free of endocrine disruptors and it's stored in a stainless steel or you, know, you can use glass as well. Um, so it's avoiding things like plastic water bottles, plastic food containers, not heating your food up on, on any kind of plastic. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a food service food, food prep company here that that will deliver food like healthy food, high protein or keto or paleo, whatever kind of food you want to your home here locally, and they tell you yeah just stick it in the microwave and heat it up for a minute, but it's in this plastic container. It's that kind of stuff. It's like just so it's awareness of those kind of details that matter, where the chemicals from these plastics, the phthalates, the BPA are leaching into your food and and water as well. So it's being aware of that. It's eating organic. So fresh fruits and vegetables, I know organic is more expensive, but it's certainly worth it because you're avoiding all the pesticides, chemicals. Um, Looking at um, farm-raised organic meats, if you do eat meat, uh, wild-caught fish, if you eat fish, um, farm-range chicken that's not being fed um, processed uh, uh, chemical-laden food. Personal care products, you mentioned like deodorant, soap, sunscreen, shampoo, laundry detergent, etc. There are a number of great apps that you can use on your phone. A, a great one is by the Environmental Working Group called Healthy Living, and it's free. So if you like free, download the Healthy Living app on your phone. And what you can do is you can go into the, the store, Target, grocery store, Publix, Walmart, wherever, and scan barcodes of products. And it will simply tell you the chemicals that's in that product, and you'll be shocked to see you look at like Tide or you look at at um, soaps that you think are hell, Irish Spring Soap, all these kind of things. That, oh, yeah, that's good. You read the ingredients and you're like, holy cow, and it really opens your eyes. That's amazing. And then you mentioned earlier you had a nine-year-old son, correct? I and do, in yes. In terms of what age is – how old is he going to be the first time you're going to test him for his testosterone levels? Great question. So I, I see um, in my – you're, I'm coming around to, your, to answer your question. I'm sorry. Um, I see in my urology practice guys in their 20s that have low testosterone. So it's not just guys in, in their 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond. It's really super young guys. And so, um, and there's also clearly a transgenerational effect we're seeing as well. So studies are showing that what's happening is through trans, transgenerational epigenetics. That means that your grandparents are exposed to these chemicals. It affects their genes and methylation, acetylation to their genes, that gets passed on in germ cell line to their children and then on to you and so on. And so it's a transgenerational effect. And so even young children are having low testosterone. And so, yeah, I'll probably test him when he's a teenager and see where he is. Uh, Not that I would give him testosterone at that young age or anything crazy like that. No, but but just to be aware of where we stand. But but I'm really big with my family and especially your children. I'd be really aware of how – all of these chemicals, it's like a soup of endocrine disruption that you're surrounded by on a daily basis and it's affecting you a little bit every day. And so think of our kids, how they have decades of exposure ahead of them. You want to do everything you can to minimize that. Yeah, that's very insightful. That's awesome. And then to uh, step back, why do you feel like it's, why is this so important? Why is it important in terms of all the men that you've seen over the past 25 years who 
how they walk in feeling with low testosterone or then how they how they feel compared when you uh, help raise their testosterone. Why, why do you feel like this is important? Yeah, so testosterone gets a lot of attention, rightfully so. And it's important because it is important for the, the reasons I mentioned earlier. It, you know, studies have shown that uh, low testosterone is clearly associated with cardiovascular disease. In fact, there have been over a dozen studies that have shown that men with lower testosterone levels have an increased risk of major adverse cardiac events. We're talking like a 30% increase in events. Low testosterone is clearly associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer, clinically significant prostate cancer, which is very counterintuitive as well. And so I, I think we need to get beyond the thought of testosterone as all about sex drive and sexual performance and building muscle and bodybuilding, all that kind of stuff. It's about your overall health. But what I want to really emphasize here, and, and this can maybe be a segue into a lot of other great conversation, is testosterone is one piece of a much bigger picture. When we talk about a systems approach, you know, testosterone is one input to your very complex human operating system. And a lot of guys have come to see me over the years and, and they'll be like, hey, doc, I'm, I, I've been on testosterone for a couple of years and I still feel like crap. Why? And my answer is, well, of course you do, because that's just one input into this very complex organism that you need to look at all the other inputs that can factor into the output. And so when we're talking about energy, we're talking about cognitive function, talking about metabolism, building muscle, burning fat and sex and and living longer and all these great things. It's a lot more than just testosterone. Yeah. So let's go there. So let's. Uh, how do you want to? Let's go into what all these different what's are. Yeah. Sure. So so you know one of the when I when I work with guys, one of the things I think about is like what's the foundation and how do we build upon that? And the foundation for me, without question, is hormones. And and a lot of those hormones are affected by endocrine disruptors, just like testosterone. So for example, thyroid. We see subclinical hypothyroidism, low thyroid levels in so many men that goes undiagnosed otherwise. Um, low DHEA, which is another steroid hormone, is actually a precursor to testosterone, but it has its own very important functions as well when it comes to mood and energy and metabolism and sleep and, and counteracting cortisol, et cetera. Um, we can look at um, nitric oxide levels, vitamin D levels, progesterone, uh, growth hormone, estrogen, it goes on and on. We have over 50 hormones that we need to look at. And most of those don't get attention. You know, it's all, it's typically always just testosterone, but, but a lot of these other hormones can really come into play when guys are complaining of low energy and issues with focus and, and can't burn that belly fat. What's going on, doc? You know, and a lot of times it's not just testosterone. And so it's looking at all these hormones and together. Then the thyroid, that's usually associated with stress. Is that correct? So, yeah, great point. So uh, when guys have low thyroid, it's typically not diagnosed or your your primary care doctor will do some lab work and say, yeah, it looks fine. You're in the in this ridiculous normal range, kind of like they do with testosterone. Um, that is often associated with stress, yes. It's often associated with gut health issues. So microbiome issues, inflammation and dysbiosis in the gut will often affect thyroid Cortisol, increased cortisol from stress will affect thyroid. Poor sleep can affect thyroid. So a lot of these are very closely interconnected for sure. Yeah, Micronutrient deficiencies, toxins, stuff like that as well. And then I have heard di differing beliefs on just taking DHEA as a supplement without... Do you have any specific thoughts on that for those? I do. So... I, I do feel strongly in the, the, the value and the benefit of having optimized DHEA levels. And by that, we're talking for men over 300. Most guys come in and their, their DHEA levels are about half of that. And so I do think it's important, um, not because I'm trying to raise testosterone with that. You know, I want to be clear, giving DHEA typically will not bump your T very much at all. It has very specific functions in and of itself. Most per importantly, it counteracts cortisol. So in this high powered world that we're living in now, we're always on the go. Guys are work, grinding, working hard, entrepreneurs trying to make a, make a buck. The stress that we're under to be a dad, to be a father, to be a, a husband, to be a business owner, to be a, a, a leader in our community, all these different roles that we have, it's a lot of stress. And that cortisol makes us store fat. It causes inflammation. It crushes testosterone, crushes cognitive function. What's the one hormone that counteracts cortisol? It's freaking DHEA. And so DHEA is super important. Yes, it has benefits for mood and energy and metabolism and stuff like that as well. But in my opinion, one of the biggest functions of DHEA is its role in counteracting cortisol. And then would that mean that it 
be best to take DHEA later in the day? So I typically recommend it twice a day. Some guys, if their levels are optimized, they could take it once a day, but um, I take it morning and night. Okay. That's awesome. And then with what we do with the High Performance Institute, is there anything from the front end to help uh, men deal with stress that you guys recommend? Oh my gosh, yeah. So, um, and and we'll come back to the other things in between um, hormones and stress because stress is a big part of it, very important part of it. But yeah, it's, it's, you know, how do we mitigate stress? Number one, recognizing that stress is not a bad thing. So you need to put it in proper context. That stress can be an empowering good thing if you, if you take it in the right context. There's a great study that was published, gosh, is maybe uh, over five years ago now where they found that people who believed stress had a negative impact on their health actually die younger. It had, it had an effect on, on mortality by simply believing stress was a negative thing. It was a crazy study. But I think it's important to, to mitigate the effects of stress by balancing it with meditation, mindfulness practices, breathing exercises, leisure. So many guys I work with, I'll be like, hey, you know, Tom, what, what do you like to do for fun? Well, I, I work. I run my business. Well, no, no. What do you What do you like to do? Well, yeah, I, I, I take care of my kids. I take them to practice. No, no. no. What do you like? And, and like, I got to pull it out of them. What do you freaking like to do? He's like, well, I like to play tennis, but I have no time. Like, that's an example of how important it is that you create balance in your life where when is the time for you? And a lot of the stress comes from we're trying to fill all those roles that I mentioned earlier when there's no balance in your life of how do you create time for yourself as well and put your oxygen mask on before you help those around you kind of concept. And that's a big part of the stress that guys are dealing with. You know, yeah, you could you can give DHEA and other supplements and 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 ways that you can um, use molecules, but I'm talking about lifestyle. And so it's focusing on sleep and breathing exercises and meditation and mindfulness and leisure and finding joy and purpose in your life and creating that real balance. I think those are really the keys when it comes to dealing with stress. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. And just from like my personal experience, I'm taking all the supplements, uh, but breath work and the longer meditation I do during the day, those are by far the two biggest things. If I'm looking at like my HRB and things like that in terms of, uh, as a man of stress, um, so I, you hundred percent. Exactly. And then in terms of, okay, so the hormones is the first kind of big input that you look at. What are some other inputs that are potentially impacting or how people look, feel and perform? Yeah. The next one in my mind without question above that is nutrition and gut health. And I really think of food as fuel and the gut controls our whole body. The microbiome, which is really the, the the confluence of all the bacteria and organisms in your gut, controls your metabolism, your energy, neurotransmitter production, hormone production, and it controls almost everything, your immune function. And so addressing the microbiome to me is a big part of it. Most guys I work with have no gut complaints whatsoever. So we're not talking about fixing constipation or diarrhea or cramping. We're not talking about fixing symptoms. We're talking about cleaning up the inflammation and the gut issues that are typically from stress and diet and, and toxins, et cetera, that are then having a negative consequence downstream. And then how are you determining whether or not they have gut issues? What are they doing? So, so yeah, so I'll, I'll give basic you know nutritional recommendations and then I'll customize those according to testing. But uh, we do a lot of microbiome testing. We'll do GI map testing, which is a stool test that you can analyze um, the health of the integrity of the gut, looking for inflammation, looking for the balance of the good bugs and the bad bugs. Uh, we do food sensitivity testing as well so th so that we can give very personalized recommendations on what you should be eating, what you should not be eating, etc. Evan, do you have a recommendation on the food sensitivity testing? Because I know a lot of those potentially uh, have, in my experience, and what we've encountered with our customers is uh, they vary and sometimes they're not that accurate. Is there a specific one thing? Yeah, there are, there are a lot of them out there, and I've heard that as well, Chase. Um, we have used KBMO for a while now, and I've been very happy with their tests and their results. Um, it is... Um, it's important to, to put it in context of a much bigger picture as well. So that's going to tell you what foods are causing an immune response and what foods that you want to temporarily uh, avoid. But it's really more focusing on a big picture. How do we reduce inflammation from a 
nutrition standpoint as well. And and that's going to be more than just avoiding those few foods that may show up on that mm-hmm. test. And then what? And then yeah. are you a believer in the stool testing? Because I've also heard countering perspectives on that of the oh, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the pro side of it is, okay, this is a very clear idea of what's going on in your gut. The con side I've heard on that is, well, this is just, it's going to be different a week from now and it's going to be a different four weeks from now. So what's the point? Um, yeah, you, you're right. There's a lot of controversy around that. And um, I'm of the opinion that I take it with a grain of salt. So that what I mean by that is it's going to list for you 20 bugs that are the, you know, the, the, the healthy, uh, good bugs, so to speak. And then there's the opportunity to say bugs. They may show 20 of them, for example. Well, shit, there, there's a hundred, hundreds of different bugs that we care about. Why is it just those 20 and those 20? And so, um, you could really critique that of what about all the other bugs we're not seeing? And there's different tests that should look at different bugs. And well, which test is right? Which bugs do we care about? I think you have to look at it from a bigger perspective. What can you gain from that test and what results may not be incredibly helpful? And what I look for is diversity. So when we look at microbiome, one of the most important things in my mind is that you have diversity of microorganisms. If you look at that test, and yes, it's only showing 20, but if you have massive increase in a few bugs of the disbody bugs, and you have very few colony count of many of the healthy or you know um, natural bugs, if you will, that's a problem. If you have ridiculously low secretory IgA or massively elevated secretory IgA, that tells you something to me that I can correct and then I can overcome and I'm and I see the benefits real time as well. I've had guys who I had one guy who had recurring sinus infections. They, he couldn't get rid of the sinus. He had them for years, went to ENT doctor and was on all kinds of different antibiotics and nothing worked. And he was incredibly frustrated that, that he couldn't get rid of his, his sinus infections. Listen, I'm not an ENT doctor. I don't I don't treat sinuses, but I know that that whenever you have chronic recurring infections, it's often associated with the gut. So when him, we cleaned up his gut. I did microbiome testing. I found the issues. We I gave him some a supplement protocol. And his signs of infections that he had 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 for years were gone. That's awesome. And then in my experience, I've seen uh, fermented foods and then resistant starches. It's like two of the big things in terms of foods that are for the good gut bacteria. Is yeah. there any potentially want to add there? And then what is what usually causes yeah. the bad? Well, and the other question I would have on that is, what creates a diverse uh, gut biome? Yeah, so so fermented foods are great. You know, it, it's real natural, real food. And I want to, you know, add in there parentheses organic if you can. Um, I highly recommend it if you can invest the extra money into it. Um, it's um, avoiding the refined processed carbs and sugars. Everyone knows this. It's avoiding the packaged products. It's avoiding any ingredients you don't recognize. To me, seed oils are crushing our gut. Uh, the omega-6 polyunsaturated fats, those are the uh, can- uh, canola is a big one. The uh, this the uh, sam- sa- excuse me, safflower, sunflower oil, cottonseed oil, all of those seed oils, pro-inflammatory. And I believe those are a big culprit when it comes to damaging the gut. And so it's minimizing those. It's focusing on the um, you know low FODMAP diet. There's an anti-inflammatory diet. There's a lot of different diets that you can you can use. In these situations, but one way or another, you need to help uh, support a healthy microbiome. I do um, like probiotics in some cases, but I choose which ones I use carefully. I always prefer spore-based probiotics. It's not about just take Akkermansia and I'm fine. Akkermansia, yeah, it's a great bug, but that's not the only one. Again, it's all about diversity. When you're taking just one single Bifido or Akkermansia or one of these these, um, probiotics out there, you're just promoting that one colony. You're not necessarily promoting diversity, and that's what it's really all about. Sleep. Yeah, sleep. Without question, sleep is vitally important. It, you know, I used to early on, I used to throw all the I used to throw the kitchen sink at the guy and I'd try to get him on a fitness program and, and deal with stress mitigation and this and that, in addition to the other stuff. But when these guys are tired, when their hormones are out of whack, when they're not eating the right foods, when their gut's a mess, the last thing that these guys want to do is work out. I don't have time. I'm too stressed. I'm, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm running a business. Leave me alone, doctor. Just give me the hormone. Give me the meds. Give me the peptides. Give me the fun stuff. So once we fix their sleep, now they have the energy and the drive to get them 
training like they need to, get them working out like they need to. So many guys are just not ready for that yet until I get them sleeping well. And so for me, it's all about, number one, tracking sleep and, and getting data, looking at quality sleep. And the way you do that is tracking it with some sort of device. Aura Ring, um, uh, Apple is is much better than it used to be. It's, it's, it's not bad. Uh, Garmin is pretty good. Uh, Whoop is okay. I don't really recommend Fitbit or BioStrap. But one way or the other, you got to track sleep. There are these beds, the eight sleep bed you, mattress you can use as well. Um, I don't... I know the study's validated. I'm still just not sold on a non-wearable for sleep, but I guess it's, it, it, the data looks good for that. Um, but what we want to see is we want to see good quality sleep, and that means an hour of deep sleep, which is 60 minutes of deep sleep every night, and two hours of REM sleep, 120 minutes of REM sleep. A lot of guys will sleep, tell me they sleep seven hours, and I have wearable data that will show their sleep was terrible when they get seven hours of sleep, but they got only 12 minutes of deep sleep. And that's not restorative. That's not going to help you repair and recover. And and so that's why I really prioritize sleep. And there are a lot of ways you can do that with lifestyle. And then there are molecules that we can use as well. There's a couple of things I want to touch on that. So my dad had uh, prostate cancer like seven years ago. And he had a, it didn't go very well. They removed the cancer, but then they he did some kind of procedure to help down there. And it did not go very well. And ever since then, uh, he has had like no energy. And then there's been, you know, other people in the family who have been like, uh, you know, he's a little bit overweight now, like to to exercise more and things like that. And it's like, I agree with you a hundred percent. I was like, if he has no, if you have no energy, I mean, come on. Like it's, it's very hard to, uh, to do it. Yeah. You're not going to work out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I finally persuaded him to, he's going down to Costa Rica next month to get some stem cells. So I'm hoping that's going oh, cool. to them that. Yeah. Now, I, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm sorry, for his prostate cancer, if he, which is often done given medications which turn off testosterone because of the cancer, that's a, that could be a big part of it as well. That's a common thing that, that docs will do. REM sleep and the deep sleep. Is there anything in particular that you have noticed that, impacts those well for you and then i have a couple more specific questions on that as well yeah so the um the there's two hours i mean i mean i've done it in the past but two hours of deep sleep is i mean that's awesome yeah that's and that that should be what everyone should be getting uh, an hour so typically 60 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. an hour of deep two hours of rem yeah exactly but still two hours of rem is 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 ideal, yeah. And the other thing to real, and I'll answer your question, but real quick, I just want to emphasize that, like when you go to the gym and you train, you're 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 lifting heavy weight, strength training. You're not building muscle. I want to I want to be sure the listener understands that you don't build muscle when you lift weights. You're tearing muscle down. When do you build muscle? It's when you're repairing, and when do you repair? When you're sleeping. And so that's why it's so important. I see guys who can't build muscle, can't burn fat, and they're sleeping like crap, and that's a big part of it. And what does poor stress do is it raises cortisol, your stress hormone as well. And that's going to further crush testosterone, make you store fat, promote insulin resistance, all the, the negative things that, that you don't want when you're trying to optimize. So your question, how can you manage it? So there are, you know, lifestyle things for sure. We look at, you know, what's your behavior for the four hours before you go to bed? And we can dive deep into that if you would like. Um, and then there are molecules that we can use to kind of augment that response as well. Yeah, let's do, let's do both. Yeah, of okay, cool. so, so in terms of, I guess, my, my kind of overarching theory in like the four hours before bed is like, turn things down. Yeah. <laughs> so like, turn down the lights, turn down the conversations, turn down the amount of, uh, I, we term as inputs in terms of what you're exposing yourself to, but just kind of turn everything down. I love that. That's great. Yeah. I think it's important to, to limit your food intake. Um, and, and we do a lot of genetics to help really individualize uh, recommendations when it comes to nutrition and, and uh, sleep and supplementation detox. But one of the, the genes that we look at are the GAD1 genes. And the GAD1 is, is glutamic acid decarboxylase. But what it really does, is it converts um, glutamate into GABA. Glutamate is a very excitatory neurotransmitter. And GABA is a very calming, soothing neurotransmitter. In fact, we give GABA as one of the molecules that I love for helping to um, calm the mind and induce sleep. Some people don't convert 
glutamate into GABA very well based on, on a genetic variant there. And so if that's the case, then if you're eating a lot of protein in the evening, a lot of glutamate, which is an amino acid, you're not converting get to GABA. That could be one of the big reasons your mind won't turn off when you want it to, to go to bed. And so for that reason, just simply avoid eating food for four hours before bed, and especially anything that's high in protein, because you may have one of that, that genetic variant. So that's a big part of it. Um, I love what you said, you know, turn off everything. Um, I like to emphasize your phone, your iPad, your laptop, all that stuff needs to be off two hours before bed. In the last hour before bed, I have five things I've come up with that I think are great things to focus on doing that last hour before you go to bed. One is reading. One is journaling. One is um, sauna. One is meditating. And one is sex. Any of those five things are a great way to, like you said, turn things off, start to relax, kind of calm the mind. Now, I would not do all those five things at the same time. It's really, really weird, of course. Um, but yeah, those are great ways that, that you can really, as you say, turn things off and kind of get your mind quiet for bed. That's awesome. And then let's talk about the molecules a little bit. So my, I used to have really, really good uh, REM sleep and deep sleep scores. Mine have gone down and I'm always experimenting with something, but I'm wondering specifically on pep, are there any specific peptides that you've seen that help with that? Because I've done, I'm, that's one of the things when I'm looking back in my journals and stuff, that getting off certain peptides is around the, the time when my deep sleep and REM sleep uh, got lower. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, you're speaking my language now. I love peptides for this. Um, you can use, you know, natural supplementation, things like GABA, things like 5-HTP, L-theanine, ashwagandha, uh, magnesium glycinate or magnesium threonate. Um, those are all supplements that you can try. Um, there are uh, prescription medications. Um, trazodone is one that I, I will reserve if needed, but it is, it's been around forever and it's actually a fairly effective uh, sleep agent. Um, you can mix that with, um, with some of the supplements I just mentioned as well. Um, so those are some of the molecules that, that you can use, but peptides are, are amazing for sleep because they boost growth hormone and growth hormone is really effective for deep sleep. And so uh, what you're talking about are peptides like the, the growth hormone secretagogues, like CJC, ipamorlin combination, or tessamorlin, are great ways to boost your own body's natural production of growth hormone, ra rather than me giving you growth hormone exogenously. By stimulating your own body's natural internal production from the pituitary, what you're doing is you're massively improving your deep sleep. And that's really one of the first benefits we see, like within the first week, of starting with those peptides, we tend to see that's the first effect you notice is better sleep. That's awesome. And that I, that might be the final yeah. thing to, to hear to get back on that. And then we want to uh, get Dr. Natalie Nidham on, or excuse me, she wasn't a doctor, but she's a, a biohacker on yesterday. And she believed in uh, being cyclical with uh, growth hormone. She mentioned something called humanin, which I had, I'm not familiar with. But she said that uh, as an example of growth hormone, when we when that goes up, this goes down, and human uh, as just as an example of something that has the benefits uh, on the brain. Um, do you have any thoughts about being cyclical with with the growth hormone peptides, or uh, to counter that? Some people just say, hey, you can just take them too. Yeah, short answer, I don't cycle it. Um, longer answer is I, I've heard a lot of different variations of it, and some of it is personal or prescriber preference. I trained through William Seeds, who is probably the peptide expert in the whole world. He's probably the leading expert when it comes to training providers on peptide therapy. And through his SSRP research group, um, he goes through the science. And from that, I, I have taken away that um, I don't cycle it. I, if someone's on CJC, and I myself, I take it continually as well. You're a great example of when you, when you stop that, you'll instantly notice a difference. And what you're describing, I'd be willing to bet, is because you stopped a growth hormone peptide, and now suddenly your brain sensing that, not not producing the same levels. And the CJC and the ipamorlin work through different mechanisms of action to increase production of growth hormone. Um, now, tessamorlin is very different. Tessamorlin is much more potent than the other growth hormone secretagogues, and it has a massive impact on IGF one. It'll raise IGF-1 by like 180 plus points. Very, very anabolic effect. 
Now, the counter, the downside to that is that that can promote insulin resistance and some other problems with blood sugar regulation. And so you don't want to do that for too long. And so I will cycle that chase where I'll maybe do CJC epimorlin for three months, maybe do a one month cycle of tesamorlin and not do that one again for another four months or so. So I will do a lot of that kind of cycling. But again, Ed, do those overlap? I don't, the CJC? I don't overlap. Now you can do, um, you can do ipamorlin with tesamorlin. You can do the, the two of those together because again, different mechanisms of action. Um, either way is fine. Yeah, there, there's so many different ways that you can do it. I, I don't know that there's necessarily a, a right or wrong way, other than you really want to be sure to cycle tesamorlin. Yeah, and then, but just to clarify, the CJC. Uh, if I'm Morellin, you would it would not make sense to do that at the same time as the Tessamorellin because JC and the uh, Tessamorellin are both targeting the same thing in terms of raising growth hormone levels. Exactly right. Yeah. So when you look at mechanism of action, the CJC and the um, the Tessamorellin work through the same mechanism of action, and so you don't want to take those at the same time. Typically, it's going to be um, either the CJC with Ibamorellin or Tesamorlin alone, or you could do testimonial with ipamorlin, but you don't. You would. You wouldn't do CJC and testimonial together, correct? And then, do you do much work with bioregulators? I'm starting to get into it more and more. Yeah, that's kind of a hot topic. Um, we're getting into that now. I don't. Have, you know, the, no one has a lot of experience with it because it's fairly new, but it's certainly a hot topic. Um, yeah, there's more to come on that. I don't have a whole lot to give you in terms of. Yeah, where I wanted. Yeah, just where I wanted to go with that was uh, they because I guess the big thing with well. I know the big thing with bioregulators is how specifically they target specific organs or hormones or body parts within the body. And I was curious with your background with that. There's one that that targets the prostate. And where I was going to go with that was, uh, is there an impact on your prostate in terms of how many times you're getting up at night to go to the bathroom? Is that in, in, indicative of prostate health? So, yeah. <laughs> As a urologist for 20, almost 25 years, I can't tell you how many guys I saw in the office whose main complaint was I get up to pee three or four or five times a night. So um, it, it's probably the, the the least enjoyable patient complaint that urologists see. But I want to emphasize that there are a lot of reasons why you get up to pee at night that have nothing to do with the prostate at all. And sometimes trying to figure out what's causing it can be difficult. What I mean by that is, I like to joke, the prostate can't see the sun, doesn't know whether it's day or night, it doesn't know, it can't tell the difference. And so when you tell me that you pee every, once every eight hours during the day, but then at night suddenly you're up every 30 minutes, there's something else going on there. Some, something, something has changed, obviously, something's different. Yes, your body makes a little more urine at night than it does during the day, but not enough that's going to make that much of a difference. What mo is the most common cause of getting up is stress or sleep apnea. Okay, cortisol stress, the most common thing, you know, you get up at two or three o'clock at night and your body has a reflex, actually. You have an internal reflex. The first thing you, when you wake up, I got to pee. But you'll go and there's like not much there, a little bit, you pee just a little bit. You're like, I didn't even, there wasn't even much there, but I had to go so bad. Not much there. Very common because it's a reflex. When you, when you wake up for whatever reason, the first thing that's going to hit your mind, I got to pee. And so I can't tell you how many guys back in my urology days before I knew all this stuff, I'd be like, yeah, here's some more processes, here's some more pro here's some more bladder relaxing medicines, anticholinergics, med you know, Vesicare and all this stuff. And none of it freaking worked because it was something else. And the guy ends up having, you know, terrible sleep apnea that I missed. And so, um, yeah, so you gotta, you gotta look at it in a broader context of why you're getting up so many times at night. If you're peeing every two hours during the day and the night, yeah, something's going on. And there. then, uh, yeah. okay, so in terms of uh, inputs that potentially could be impacting uh, health and performance, we've uh, looked at hormones, the GI tract, uh, digestion, and sleep. Is there anything you look at? Yeah. Um, yeah. Next, next, next is definitely fitness. And so now it's time to get off your ass and move. And um, I, I believe wholeheartedly in the massive benefits of um, regular fitness activity movement when it comes to cardiovascular health when it comes to hormones when it comes to um you know mental state when it comes to longevity i mean the, the science is clearly there and so uh one of the most common issues i see with the high performing men i work with whether it's entrepreneurs whether it's c-suite guys whether it's um sometimes even retired athletes 
where they're just not training. They're just, they're, they, they prioritize other things in their life other than actually fit into their day. Yeah. And then do you have any specific recommendations that you do from there? Um, do you mean yeah, so, personalized so protocols it, based on what you see from yeah, your- we we really individualize it based on on the the guy, based on his goals, based on injury status, based on what his what equipment he has, based on what he likes to do. In general, most guys tend to do too much cardio, too much long distance endurance kind of stuff, like going for you know ten mile runs or going for um, you know three hour bike rides, and not doing enough of the strength training. Um, there's so much emphasis on um, on low intensity work that I think the strength training gets lost. And for me, it's all about how do you create an anabolic state? And that's, you got to build, you got to fix hormones, you got to fix nutrition, fix sleep so that you can build muscle. And when you build muscle, you're going to fix so many things. You're going to fix insulin resistance. You're going to reduce inflammation. You're going to fix hormones. You're going to fix mental state, cognitive function, etc. There are so many positive benefits to building muscle and the other result of that is you're going to burn fat. And so when people are trying to lose weight, one of the most important things you can do is actually build muscle, which is going to help you burn fat while you're sleeping. It's almost like interest. It's almost like, it's like interest while you're sleeping. You're basically like burning fat without even trying once you've built muscle. Yeah, I agree on percent. I love that. Uh, okay. So we have hormones, digestion, GI, sleep, physical fitness is those the four do we have anything else yeah, so, so that's when i then look at uh stress we talked about that earlier and um and that's when i really put an emphasis on mindset on stress on um you know what behaviors do you have we talked about um um meditation mindfulness breathing exercises leisure finding purpose all that kind of um, stuff that I, that i think is really important and then the last part is detox and, and that's where we really, again, come back around to where we started the conversation on the toxins in your environment, um, whether it's uh, in your food, in your drinking water. That includes EMF uh, in your environment. You know, if you're, I see these guys wearing these AirPods. It drives me crazy. Just I'm, I think of the damage that it's causing. Um, and so that's really, to me, the final step in, in taking a very comprehensive systems approach to men's health. Now I have a team who work with the women as well. My focus is purely with the men, but it requires that really integrated approach at looking at all those different inputs that are all affecting the output that you're looking for. Yeah, that's super helpful. And then in terms of getting people to move forward holistically on all these inputs at the same time, how do you guys kind of go about at the Institute communicating and and teaching it in a way so guys actually execute and and do this holistically. Yeah, great question. You know, I I used to when I was running this my pro, my G one program years ago, I used to throw the kitchen sink at a guy, and what I found was nothing would stick because it was too much to handle, and it needed to have a sequence, it needed to have a methodical process to take guys through, and that's why I spent years refining to get to the point now where. Once I fix hormones, okay, now let's move on to the next step. Let's look, let's look at your gut and clean up your nutrition. What are you eating and what do the genetics say you should be eating? And then let's fix your sleep. What do we got to do to fix sleep? Lifestyle, molecules, whatever. Fitness, stress, detox, in that order. And when you take that methodical approach, you're going to be sure you hit on everything and it's not going to be overwhelming. And it's, you know, you and I talked before we went live here. It's about consistency. You know, my my three-pronged approach is advanced diagnostics, personalized approach, and consistency, precision lifestyle. And so it's creating those habits that are going to last. And, you know, I love all these books, Tony Habits by B.J. Fogg I got behind me, and all these other books on how do you create consistency in your life. And um, I love um, Dr. Hardy talks about future cast. Who do you want to be? Who's the person you want to be in the future? And what does that person do? So you're not trying to do things to become that person. It's what does that person do? And that's what you got to integrate into your daily life. And then it becomes easy. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, there's a guy, Richard Wiseman wrote a book called The As If Principle. Act as if you're that person. As if. That's awesome. That. Yeah. And then uh, you look great. Yeah. And I know part of your shift from switching from uh, formal uh, urologist to uh, head doctor at the High Performance Institute is uh, you kind of really dove in on your health. You were the first... Um, patient, if I understand that correctly, 
Can you talk a little bit about what some of your day-to-day practices are? Yeah, so uh, I am now training my medical team. So I have a, a team of uh, medical providers. I have a team of functional medicine trained health coaches uh, who I work with very closely. Um, we've we've spent the last six, nine months creating a training manual for every one of them, every one of the, the individuals in my office, my team members who are so important for um, providing the results we give. And for me now, it's how can I be a better leader to help my team carry that forward? I now have um, Gap Institute here in Sarasota. We've become so busy that other providers have come to me and how do I open a location of my own? And so now we're starting to work with um, Scottsdale, Arizona and Jacksonville, Florida and up in Kansas. And we're going to be opening another location probably in Naples. And so, you know, my passion is how do I have a bigger impact? And to do that, I need to train other people around me. And so now it's really on building that team. And, and um, I can only see so many people at a time. But if I can build, um, you know, my team around me, we can have so much more of an effect. That's amazing. And then how is that process going for you? It's going well. We're, we're growing faster than I can keep up with, but it's so fun. And, you know, I, I used to have a job. I used to work. Now this is a passion project, man. It's just every day. I just, I love, I love what I do. Yeah. I love it. Training with just six fun wars. That's right. That's right. And then in terms of your health practices, is there anything that you make sure that you do every day or very consistently in terms of taking care of your hormones, taking care of your digestion, taking care of your sleep, your physical fitness, your stress? Yeah. I, I practice what I preach. Um, I, I have a very clear schedule. Um, my, my Google calendar is packed, but you'll see blocks of my day. Like today, um, just before this, I have my workout. Like my team can't touch me. They can't find me because I'm at the gym. And, and, and for some people, early morning workouts are the key. For me, my mind works when I wake up. I've learned the hard way. My body's not ready yet. And so I've learned that I work, I train best in the middle of the day. And so I block out my calendar for that time. It's being very intentional about everything you do. And so I create time in my life for purpose. And my big why are my kids. And, you know, we talked or we were trying to get this interview scheduled and you asked for full disclosure, you asked for a weekend. And what I say, I said, no, because I'm very intentional. And my purpose is all about how can I be the best dad that I can be for my kids. And I made a commitment to them that I'm not going to work on the weekends if I don't have to, if I could do anything to do it during the week, I will. And so it's making little micro decisions like that. It's, you know, we eat clean. Um, I do uh, continuous glucose monitoring on, on an intermittent basis to make sure that um, I'm eating the right foods that are, that are uh, right for me. I'm doing intermittent microbiome testing. Any supplement, any peptide, any hormone I prescribe for someone, I've tried or taken myself as well. So, man, I practice what I preach. And then you're currently – you're. You're taking the CJC and the Epimorlin, and is there anything else in the peptide stack that you take in CC? I've, man, I've tried so many of them. Yeah, I've, I've cycled through Mata C. I've cycled through uh, Epitalon. I've cycled through Tessamorlin. Um, I've tried DSIP one time for sleep. I, didn't f- I don't find DSIP for sleep works that great for, um, for most of my clients I've tried it with. I didn't notice a big difference either. Um, I have um, I've tried C-Link and C-Max. Back when I had COVID, when it March of 20, when, it first, when things first started happening, um, I had a ton of peptides ready to go, which I believe really helped me at the time. Um, I still massively believe in thymus and alpha. It's an incredible peptide for immune function. Um, so a lot of stuff there around peptides, but I've tried them all, man. And then what about anything specifically for hormones, supplements that, that you take? Well, yeah, so, so full disclosure, testosterone, thyroid, DHEA, vitamin D, nitric oxide, I take it all, man. Yeah. And, and it's about, you know, I have this this diagram that I show when you can find on my website of th- there's this spectrum of diseased state on one end and optimized state on the other end. And traditional medicine, and I would argue even functional medicine, is aimed at getting you from diseased state through root cause, illness, symptoms to neutral, free of disease. I feel better. I feel fine. No more complaints. Dude, that's where I start. That's where I start. And how do we from there employ epigenetics and optimization and personalization and customization, precision lifestyle to get you to optimized? And that's to me what it's really all about. I love that. And then with TRT, the body stops producing testosterone, correct? When we take TRT? Correct. So when you take testosterone exogenously, that will tell the pituitary, hey, we're good. We don't need any more testosterone. So that production turns off internally. 
The common question I get is, well, why would I want to do that? Well, the answer is if your testosterone levels are low, low to the point that the natural approaches are not working, are not getting it to where it needs to be, then you need, you know, again, we've gone through the benefits of testosterone. So you need testosterone therapy. When you get your testosterone therapy, it's going to now get your levels where they needs to be. And, and what do you know? You have amazing energy. Your brain is sharp. Your focus is crystal clear. You're burning fat. You're building muscle. You're having sex. You feel like a man again. You feel alive. Why on earth would you want to stop that? In fact, no one does. Once you're on testosterone, no one says, yeah, I think I want to stop now. Bullshit. Everyone says, don't you dare stop my testosterone, doc. And so that, that question I get all the time, and it, it, it's kind of silly because it, it, it's looking at the wrong way. Your levels already stink. You need testosterone. Once you get testosterone, you're going to feel amazing. So why on earth would you want to stop? And that's the real answer to that question. Yeah, that's super insightful. And then in terms of fertility for men, PRT potentially uh, reduces sperm production. Calm is something oh, yeah. that I would um, call it helps that. Have you noticed any other thing in terms of natural, like herbs or anything like that, that can help? Yeah, great point. So, so this is where those nuance and this, you know, clinical decision making, having a conversation with, with the patient. Um, but if a guy is still looking to have children, then you don't want to take testosterone therapy because it will suppress normal production of sperm. And so, clomid is one way, uh, molecule wise that you can stimulate your body to produce more testosterone. Um, and clomiphene. So clomid is, is clomiphene. And clomiphene is starting with the EN is uh, a cleaner version of it is much, uh, less likely to cause side effects that clomid can cause, um, is another option. HCG, injectable HCG is another way that you can stimulate, uh, fertility as well, or stimulate testosterone production and fertility. And so those are some of the molecule ways that you can boost testosterone production. Uh, there's a peptide out there called Kispeptin, which is supposed to help boost testosterone production as well. I have not seen incredibly great results with that peptide, so I kind of quit using it. Um, the natural approaches, for sure, everyone should be doing. The strength training, the improving sleep, micronutrients, um, you know, all those kind of things are, are reducing stress. Incredibly important. Most guys... If their free testosterone is five, that's not going to get their free testosterone up to 20 like it needs to be. And then for those that are on TRT now, but want to have a baby in the near future, what would your recommendations be? Yeah, I've had a number of guys like that where I've been able to get them off of testosterone, put them on other things like HCG and, and, and clomiphene combination there and get their testosterone levels where they need to be and their, their sperm function came back. And so it certainly is possible. Well, this has been super... Uh... Amazing, Tracy. Real quick before we wrap up, um, I'd like to touch on, you mentioned before the interaction that we had about having uh, a podcast on the weekend to try and, and get you in in September. And you say, no, that's not time with my son. And I'd love to talk about how serious your taking is golf journey. And then with the context stuff, this has actually been a pretty consistent theme on this yeah. uh, podcast. So we did an episode on the original Gracie brothers and what they kind of built in Brazil with all their lineage. And then we did an episode on Jamal Murray, the Denver Nuggets guard and his dad and how his dad trained him. And then we had Spartan race founder, uh, Joe DeSena on and Joe communicated his dream of having like an 800 kid school of like Shaolin monks, just training and working out all day. Uh, so you said that uh, <laughs> you have uh, your nine year old's traveling to California. He's traveling North Carolina from Florida. I'm looking at, at from a dad perspective. How are you kind of approaching uh, his golf game? It's a lot of fun. Uh, he, you know, he started at age five. Grandma got him a set of, of plastic, you know, golf clubs with those plastic balls, and he was in the backyard and he wouldn't put it down. And we got him more and more, and he just loved it. Fell in love. It was never me pushing it on him or anything. He just fell in love with it on his own. And I'm a hack. I'm not a good. So he, he certainly didn't get it genetically from me. And so from five to nine, he has become this amazing, incredibly um, uh, successful competitive golfer where last year he was like eighth in the world at world championships at Pinehurst. And so, you know, he's, he's definitely right up there with, with the best kids in the world. Um, and so it's amazing to see his growth and development. And yeah, we were at the, the IMG World Championships at Torrey Pines this past July. We were at the I, uh, U.S. Kids World Championships in uh, Pinehurst in, in August. 
and we're going to a regional tournament um, on the east coast of Florida in a couple weeks. And it, it's just so rewarding to see anyone who has kids can relate to how rewarding it is to see your kid thrive and be successful at competition like that. But to me, I want to, I want to really just highlight that it's so it's amazing when it comes to personal development and what Graham is learning, my son is learning and what your boys in basketball or any other uh, men out there whose kids are involved in a sport, they're learning life lessons. How do you deal with adversity when that putt doesn't fall and you lose a tournament by one stroke? When you hit a bad shot, when you're struggling, when nothing seems to work, when you're having a bad day, when you're dealing with adversity, how do you freaking deal with that? And it's hard to teach that to a nine-year-old, but man, once you do, it's it's life lessons that apply to every aspect of your life. And so it's it's a it's tremendous joy for me, and I just try to soak it all up because yeah, I love it all that. goes so fast. Yeah, yeah, I have a I mentioned fourteen and eleven, and recently. Uh, we had our dog pass away earlier than we expected. And I communicated with the 11 year old, how he was doing. And he said he was, he was doing good. He was only, he was focusing on what he can control. And, uh, man, for years I've been trying to put that into, and I, it seems like they just, they do not get it. And then you hear it like that. And it's like, yes. Um, yeah. And then, that amazing? uh, yeah. So obviously he's yeah. passionate about it and he probably has some inborn talent, but still getting eighth in the world. is uh, Huge. I mean, that's there's a lot of kids in the world playing golf. So, what specifically beyond those two factors do you think potentially have helped him advance to get to that from the first time getting the clubs at five? He is so incredibly focused and driven. Um, I think sure he has he has natural born talent that I don't know where the hell hell it came from. It wasn't me, Um, but there's definitely a drive there, a competitive nature. Um, a um, a desire to be the best at whatever he does. With that, though, comes, um, you know, we've all failed. You, you can't win every time. And so along with that comes the, the suffering of not being the best and not winning. And how do you deal with that? And how can you take that and, and be stronger for it? And um, that's what I try to work with him on every day. And um, it's a challenge. Sometimes I want to pull my hair out because, you know, you think he's not listening. But like you said, they're listening. You just can't tell. And they don't want you to know that they're they're listening, but they're listening. That's awesome. And then do you you go through any protocols with him in terms of sleep the night before or food or going into the tournament? Yeah. You know, I shared a lot of what I do with him and he's become a lot more health conscious. Um, So we do focus a lot on that, especially around tournament time. We will, you know, the sleep stuff is really big deal. Um, at age nine, trying to get him to go to sleep normally, you know, you know what that's like is a challenge. Um, nutrition is definitely his biggest weakness. And, um, that's something that, you know, as a nine year old, I, I try to instill upon him. Um, it's hard when, when kids don't want to eat healthy foods because they don't taste as good as, as, as crap. And so that's a big challenge. But, um, I, I point out, look at the athletes out there. Look what they're doing. Look at the pros. Look what they're doing. Roy doesn't look like that eating that. You know, and that's my favorite golfer, so I try to use that as an example. But it, it's hard, man. Yeah, still parenting, still parenting. As skilled as they may be at their sport, they're still he's still nine. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, we're you mentioned like we're in the endocrine disruptor suit. It's like what we're they're surrounded by, it, right? So yeah, that's right. So it is. It's 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 parenting. Awesome, Tracy. Well, this has been uh, absolutely amazing, super insightful. I see that. Uh, you on instagram youtube gap and institute linkedin uh anybody that wants to specifically reach out to you what's the best way to do that of course we'll put that in the show notes appreciate it yeah so um any listeners if you want to text the word health to 26786 again health to 26786 i'll send you a copy of our high performance health handbook and a link if you want to reach out to my team you'll have access to that as well that's awesome love that well i appreciate it tracy you get a home run like you knew we would i'm glad we got it scheduled and uh Oh, for me in person. Hell yeah. Absolutely. You as well, Chase. Thank this you. Fun.